Ladies and gentlemen, don't go. This is going to be an excellent panel. We have two wonderful speakers, and it's such a pleasure to be here with you all this afternoon. What we want to do is to really take some time and drill down and focus on the issue of social responsibility, governance, institutions, the individual. What can we do to make a difference? In recent decades, what we've done as a society is focus on the me first syndrome. Why me? Look at me. Poor me. Help me. That narcissism has really, in many ways, eroded uh, our sense of social responsibility. And that, among many other factors, has really pushed our economy to the brink of collapse. But there is a silver lining. And what this crisis is doing is that it's allowing us to shed the spotlight on people that have been marginalized, the unfortunate in the world, that don't have a voice. So this is our moment to take a little time and to give them a voice. Two guests uh, I will introduce to you who are at the forefront of this fight. And they really work tirelessly to help the underprivileged and uh, do such an incredible job. It's my privilege right now to introduce them. Mary Robinson is the president of Realizing Rights, and she is the former president of Ireland, as well as the former UN Commissioner of Human Rights. And she always jokes that she actually became interested in human rights because she was the only sister that was wedged between four brothers. So that's how this became her mission. Mo Ibrahim is the founder of the Mo Ibrahim Foundation, and also, as many of you may know, the founder of Celtel International that builds and operates uh, mobile phones uh, in Africa. And uh, fortunately for me, it was recently renamed Zane. So I uh, have had a lot of free publicity and a lot of valuable marketing thanks to this. There are, in fact, signs all around Africa, wherever I go, as soon as I land, and it says, welcome to Zayn country. So CNN is trying to capitalize on this, I hope. Um, and in the future, you may see my face alongside some of those signs. But Mo, thank you very much for that. I would like for you to please give a wonderful welcome to our two distinguished guests who we're very lucky to have with us today. Mary, let's start by discussing first what has been the social impact of the economic crisis on the ground from what you've seen. From the visits that I've been making to African countries um, this year and in recent years, the, the impact of a number of crises is very real. The food crisis was very serious. And then there was the fuel crisis, which hasn't gone away really. And now we have the self-inflicted rich world financial crisis, which is beginning to have very severe impacts. And more and more, I'm aware of the impacts of climate change. So I was in Rwanda recently, and farmers don't know when to sow anymore because the weather pattern has changed. And in villages in Africa, people do know about the weather for more than 200 years because grandparents pass it to grandchildren to grandchildren. So they know that there's more rain, there's more dryness, uh, the patterns have changed completely, and it's very destabilizing when you're living on the margins anyway. I was in Liberia, and the same thing. We were at a wonderful women's conference that the president of Liberia, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, had organized. And uh, the discussion between uh, women leaders coming from different parts of Africa was m very much about the impact of the climate change and the financial impact. And both are caused outside. Um, even the climate change, the whole continent of Africa is responsible for less than 4% of these greenhouse gas emissions that cause global warming. And they were not at all responsible for the financial bubble breaking um, of you know, the toxic assets, etc. And yet they are really feeling the impact. For example, um, you know, inward investment into African countries, Mo knows this very well, is beginning to dry up. It had been quite buoyant because there is now a sort of selfish looking to home and a protectionism. Well, let's talk a little bit about that. I mean, what has been uh, the effect on business in emerging markets particularly? Uh, no doubt there's a problem because the, uh, uh, the investor, the hedge funds started to retreat. Uh, 
they needed to cash, uh, whatever they need access to cash. Cash is king now. And uh, different markets to read from, obviously, is, is, is the emerging markets, uh, Africa and, uh, and Asia. So people are bearing the brunt of what happened, which they, they did not contribute to it, really. Give me specific examples. Uh, you just look at the stock market. Look at the prices of shares in, in Nigeria or in South Africa or elsewhere or Egypt. Is all affected negatively by what happened. There is nothing wrong with the banks. Uh, there's nothing wrong with the Egyptian banks. It's not exposed to any of these toxic assets. But because investors are withdrawing, uh, the, the all share prices have been affected. And uh, so credit crunch started also to loom large, uh, which is one of the unfortunate results of globalization. You know, the, the, the European and American came and lectured us in Africa about globalization, how wonderful it is, you guys must join us, and uh, here we are. Uh, we have the credit crunch. We, uh, uh, before that, as you said, we had the three Fs, you know, the food crisis, the financial crisis, and the fuel crisis before that. So it is, it's, it's been tough. But uh, Africa will get over that very quickly because the basis of the economies are, are really sound. Uh, uh, there's no problems in Africa. We, we actually, our real estates are very cheap, actually, unlike the United States, so it's undervalued. Uh, I think we'll, we'll get over it. And actually, return on investments in Africa is the highest. And sooner or later, people will realize that, and the money will come back. And when you're looking at... Um investment in Africa, but that has you know, a, a dimension of social responsibility at the same time, Mary. How do you deal uh, from a business perspective with, with governments uh, that are doing things that are hurting their own people? Like, let's take the Sudanese government, for example, that has targeted its own people, the crisis that you've done a lot with uh, in Darfur. How, do, how does business work with government like that? It's a very uh, interesting and very relevant challenge, which we're working quite a lot with. Uh, I come from a human rights background, but when I was serving as UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, I recognized that uh, the Office of High Commissioner was tracking violations by business, and um, violations by extractive industries of indigenous peoples, child labor, exploitative conditions. But what we weren't thinking about, but needed to think about, was the energies of the corporate sector to change things. And as we heard in the um, uh, dignity section um, from, uh, you know, th th there is a great deal that can be done in relation to the Millennium Development Goals, etc. But one of the dilemmas that I hear from corporate leaders is, uh, what is our responsibility when the government doesn't have standards and may in fact be an abuser? And um, we have examples, for example, of uh, companies that were doing business in Darfur and were being campaigned against by the Save Darfur and other uh, companies. And one of the responses, which I thought was very interesting, was to engage with Amnesty and other NGOs and share the dilemma and say, how do we move forward? And one of the ways that some of the companies, ABB and Ericsson, and that have been moving forward is to encourage a, uh, a group of companies in Khartoum to be engaged with the Global Compact. And there is a local network now in Khartoum um, of companies that are beginning to address their responsibilities, and these are Sudanese companies. And so uh, I think we need to engage corporations, and uh, I'm working very closely with my colleagues with um, the uh, new uh, mandate on business and human rights, which is exercised by Professor John Ruggie, who used to work in the UN uh, when I was there. And he has put forward a framework which has been accepted by the Human Rights Council and by governments and by corporate lawyers, etc which is that um, governments have responsibility to protect their people from violations by states. And that's now clearly stated, and we'll see how that becomes more uh, operationalized. But secondly, all corporations, including Google, including all the corporations represented here um, at this uh, Zeitgeist, um, all corporations have responsibility to respect all human rights. And I think it's interesting, because I would wonder how many of those represented in this room have actually thought that tr through. How many have human rights uh, policies that are part of their sustainability as corporations? Has Google, because of its great power in the world, really thought through its responsibility to respect all human rights? It has thought through in freedom of expression and worked with NGOs. And I am glad that there is a network that Google belongs to and many of the other IT companies. But it's broader than that. Give us your experience. 
this issue. Uh, MIR is not just human rights, mm. it's, it's governance. Yes. And we, we need to look at governance from two angles. One is the uh, political governance, how the governments are, and then corporate governance. Mm. And that, of course, includes human rights, but it's much wider, really, mm. uh, than human rights. Uh, we're working in Africa on the, on the issue of corporate governance in our foundation, where we produce an index for governance. We, actually, I think it's a good idea. Everybody should have that. The European guy should have one as well, and the American guy should have it. What is it? Just, just explain uh, it to we, people. We think governor, governments have, have gone away, you know, got away with murder, really. Uh, nobody's looking, evaluating. What, what, what they're delivering to their people. And uh, the governments had certain responsibilities uh, to their people in the economic areas, in health, education, in gender issues, human rights, etc. And uh, what we're doing is we're measuring performance. We have 59 parameters, and we measure the performance of every African country uh, uh, over the year, and we're using a lot of data to, to do that. And then we we'll publish that index. We rank everybody: education, health, clean water, uh, economic development, all sorts of elements which are the basket of goods governments need to deliver to their people. It's their responsibility: security, safety, crime, etc. And from that, people can have a decent and informed discussion with their own governments about their performance. And that, I think, is something very useful. But what we also is lacking, in my view, is a similar index for, 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 for business, for, for, for companies. What about corporate governance in companies? That's something which we don't talk much about. In my view, I think the financial crisis is a failure of corporate governance. Absolutely. Do How you agree with that? I, I must say I, I, I do, and it was a failure also, as we heard earlier, of regulators just not being capacitated, able to understand what was going on with these toxic, toxic assets, etc. But it was also a failure um, in the sense of uh, agreed to short-term gains rather than a long-term sustainability, but and that's bad you, governance. Yes, but if you were on the board of Citibank, hmm. okay, you have a fiduciary duty hmm. to know what the company is doing. And if the people are doing some, 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 some stupid things, mm. you need to stand up and say, hey, that's wrong. You have fiduciary duty. And I think all the board of all these banks should be really asked the question, where, where are you guys? How were you managing? Because that is the job of the board. And none of those guys dispense their duties honorably, in my view. There's a failure of corporate governance as well because we never switch the light on corporate governance. Take corruption, an issue always raised about Africa, say Africa, corruption, etc., etc. The fact is, corruption is a zero-sum game. You have a corrupt politician, you have a corrupt businessman or businesswoman. It has to work like that because politicians don't corrupt themselves. Somebody pays the checks. Who is this guy? We never know. Do you know that in Europe, until eight years ago, corruption was legal? It was tax deductible, actually. <laughs> this is a fact. And under pressure from ACED, Europe introduced their, 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 their anti-corruption acts. Of course, the states on this occasion were much better. They had the Foreign uh, Corruption Act much, 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 uh, you know, years back. But very interesting. I ask everywhere I go in Europe, in Germany, France, here in England, everywhere, how many cases of corruption in Africa was brought to courts? Do you have a single case which has been prosecuted in Europe? Do you know the answer? Is nil, is zero. The law has never been used. So it's hypocrisy. When people talk about corruption, and because corruption is, is it, it, it just, it, look, it is it's like adultery. It takes a man and woman, two consenting adults, but then we always complain about the woman and we forget the partner. Here the partner is sitting here, is you. Gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, some of you are the corrupt partners of the politicians. What are we doing about this? Where is corporate governance? 
Mary, what's been your experience with Where that? Where is corporate governance? I, I agree with the point you're making, Mo, but of course, corruption is much more pervasive. It's the corrupt teacher who wants money for grades, or even sometimes, unfortunately, sex of young girls for grades. Um, yeah. It's the corrupt health official, etc. And what I, I agree with you about the need for better corporate responsibility as part of corporate sustainability, because the perception now, and this is something I'm really very interested in, there is a sense that with power comes responsibility. And the corporate sector, Google, for example, in a very sort of dominant position, has huge power. And so do other big players that we've been hearing about uh, today. And there is a sense that there is a corporate uh, responsibility that is close to governance, not to substitute for governments. They have their responsibility, but it goes much further than just the bottom line. And what I find very encouraging is that business leaders, quite a number of them, are realizing this. Um, I was in Washington less than two weeks ago at the Initiative for Global Development, which began in Seattle uh, with Bill Gates Sr. and um, uh, Dan, um, what's his name, the former senator there, and, and, and a number of others, and it spread from city to city. And it's now co-chaired by Colin Powell and Madeleine Albright. And we were having intensive discussion about how business in the United States, plus government, plus non-governmental organizations like Oxfam, which I'm honorary president of, and CARE, and these large organizations, can work together in a 21st century way to address the Millennium Development Goals well, can that we, we heard about today. Can we drill down on that a little bit? I mean, how do you align everyone's interests and, and the driving force of business, which is also to, to make profit, but it's also socially responsible. Because look, the, the, the thing, the thing here is, let me, let me just it's make real. this point, and Mary brought this up. You have short-term interests. It's a timetable issue. You have a short-term interest by a corporation that is driven by pressure from shareholders, uh, quarterly earnings, um, and, and so forth. And the, the likelihood of investing in that direction versus a long-term uh, social responsibility is much much higher, yes, isn't it? Allow me, allow me to disagree. The interest of, of a corporate is, can never be short term. That has been the interest of the management which has been incentivized over long term. It is not the interest of the shareholders. It is not the interest of the employees. So let us get that straight. It's the interest of a business to have sustainable, successful business. We're investing for the future. When we build our company, we never made any profit for the first five years. So what do you say, what do you say to business for, leaders for that uh, are looking for a short-term uh, gain? Yes, because the management is in staff correctly. Again, again, lack of corporate governance. Mm. How, the, how the board sets intensive to the people. That's why the bankers were doing all these funny deals to get the, the business, and then they bugger off. And, you know, so they are get fired, but they had their few millions, and they are happy to keep it. But if they had been incentivized over long term, it would have been different. All what I'm saying is what we lack, we need to walk the talk now. Enough of hypocrisy and nonsense. We need to walk the talk. And so much, i just give you one example. I was the other day at a conference of ETI. I don't know if you heard about ETI. This is the initiative for uh, transparency in extractive industries. I discovered something horrible. I could not believe it. Actually, do you know that all these big companies, Shell, Exxon, whatever, when they go and have a big oil contract in Angola, or they never publish the contracts. Nobody knows how much they bid Angola, for what, where the money goes. And these are listed companies. They are signing billions of dollars of contracts, which is, is, is not accounted for. And we don't know what is happening. But I was talking to the Norwegians. The Norwegian take something like 84% of the revenue of oil in Norway. A typical African or South American company takes only 25%. I think we have the answer. We know why. Because that contract is secret. Somebody got 5% and accepted a 25%. How much money was stolen for the government? This is much more than the total aid funds. All the funds going in aid is stolen. This is the point. That's why it is important for us to draw the line and say, no, we really have to switch on the light. We know who's doing what to whom. And it's so simple. ESA could have changed that overnight. Accounting standards. But the it should be a requirement for any listed company to publish yeah. this kind of contract. It's so simple. But they're not doing it. 
but the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative is that kind of 21st century holding to account that I'm really talking about. It started with Transparency International yes. saying that there's a need for more transparency, publish what you pay. George Soros and others got engaged in this, and now we have a structure. It's not perfect, but it's better. We have the Fair Labour Association for labour standards. We have uh, the um, uh, voluntary principles for um, operating but Mary, in countries we, of conflict. We are trying to persuade companies, please be kind, come and join and sign to this ETI. So over three years, we we'll start to disclose some information. What I'm saying, all what you need is to change the, uh, the accounting rules. Hmm. It's one paragraph, and all those guys will have to declare. It's hmm. finished. Hmm. Why can't we pass a law like that? It's so such a stock exchange in London, New York, Frankfurt. It's hmm. done. This should be three requirements of the listing. You publish your multi-billion billion dollar. Is that too strange? Google, you publish your accounts. My company will publish our accounts. Hmm. What, we can never hide five billion, ten billion dollar accounts to say I'm not saying what I was saying. Uh, this hmm. is crap. Hmm. Come on. <laughs> Tell us what you really think. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Really, we need to walk the talk. The same guy is lecturing us about this. And about. Then, then we see really bad behavior. And, and that gets bad results. How many people are the, the people in Angola that they need this money? Mm. The one in Wisman is appears. What are the opportunities here um, in this current economic context and, and w with all its flaws? What are the opportunities in emerging markets that would help people's lives and w would help business position themselves in a way to be more socially responsible? Well, first of all, I absolutely agree with Mo about much more accountability, much more transparency. And also, um, I'm encouraged by uh, the fact that uh, the internet affords a wonderful opportunity to uh, share information and track what's happening. Um, there's a website that I imagine a number of you are familiar with, uh, www.business-humanrights, all one word, business-humanrights.org. And it is um, a website which tracks the performance of corporations. And it uh, acknowledges good practices, what is being done well, etc. but it also tracks um, in a very uh, sophisticated way now, and it has, um, it's a centre run out, in fact, out of London, the Centre for uh, Human Rights, and it uh, has uh, people located in Hong Kong, in um, uh, Los Angeles, in South Africa, that, that um, are tracking what companies are doing. And uh, it, it's now a go-to place, um, and the uh, mandate of John Ruggie on what he's doing, on uh, creating a kind of um, a standard for all companies now that they must respect all human rights. And it's more than a sort of passive do no harm. It's a due diligence standard. So I would hope if we want to project it over the next couple of years that uh, every CEO will find it necessary to do a due diligence. Am I sure that my corporation is not undermining, and by human rights here, I mean the broad human rights, to food and safe water and health and education, labor standards, health and safety at work, but also um, what the impact is on local communities, on um, indigenous peoples, etc. And you know, I think that uh, that would be a huge plus for accountability for human rights. And it's not substituting for the responsibility of governments. It's, it's parallel to it. Where do you see opportunities? Yeah, well, I respect what Mary says. I, I talk to people pockets. You know, those guys are business people. They're, you know, they're more interested in the return. I would say that the highest return on investment over the last four or five years, according to the World Bank, have been in Africa. That this is a real business opportunity there. Uh, mobile phones, when we started mobile phones, nobody would go and invest in Africa. We went to Africa and, and we made huge returns on our investment. The average return was eight and a half times their money. Our shareholders got this sort of thing. While at the same time, we built Africa, we connected Africa, which is wonderful. So just go and have the courage and do the business. And actually, I have a message for, I'm very surprised for the guys here in Google and uh, uh, the Microsoft. I, I mean, you have one billion, where, where is Nikesh and those guys are not here? Larry? <laughs> they bring me here and they go away, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> they, 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 uh, there is one billion people who live in Africa. Africa hasn't got broadband. How are you going to expand the business of Google or Microsoft if you don't roll your own broadband there? When we built 
the mobile networks in Africa, and Africa has been a huge success story, by the way. Penetration in Africa now is over 30%. There is business, there is money to be made in Africa. 30% is the penetration. The largest number of subscribers, new subscribers this year, last year, the year before, were in Africa. More than all the subscri new subscribers in Europe. Because Europe is stagnated. Google, your business will stagnate as well. You cannot get new customers. You need to get new customers. You need to go and build the broadband there. And you, you should have the balls to go and do that. And, uh, you know, I, I'm sorry there's no executives here from uh, Google to talk I'm to. I'm sure they'll hear what you said. <laughs> I hope so. Is, is anyone from Google here? <laughs> Would you like to respond? <laughs> He just said you have no balls. There's a wonderful, <laughs> there's a wonderful business opportunity, and I don't know how those guys. I mean, Nikish calls himself global business development, and he's not doing it. So what? What is developing? I don't know. Anyway, Mary, um, what about uh, climate justice? Hmm. Changing gears here. Hmm. I mean, this is something that's critical. You've been focusing on this. Hmm. What's the key message here? The key message is back to the figure I used earlier, that uh, the whole continent of Africa, for example, and it's true of other parts of the um, poorest parts of the world, isn't responsible for these greenhouse gas emissions, but is feeling already, um, and it's not of the future, it's now, changes in weather patterns, which are by and large negative, which are driving back the capacity to reach the Millennium Development Goals, which are so vital. And um, I think what, uh, we have to be aware of, I mean, I agree about the broadband for African countries, but I also know there are two billion people on, in our world today, 21st century, who have no access whatsoever to electricity. Um, you know, it's as basic as that. And that's what we, when we're talking about absolute poverty, we're talking about a lack of access, mainly to electricity, for health, for education, for all the other um, possibilities. And we heard a wonderful display about statistics this morning, and I, I've heard it once before, and every time I hear um, Professor Hans uh, Rosling uh, present, uh, you know, it's just wonderful um, about you know, making progress in that way. But why is it that we have social entrepreneurs who are producing solutions of cooking um, with batteries, of using waste, of distilling water, but they're all small scale? Where is the determination, because this is the climate justice to me, the determination that the technologies will be developed with applications for the poorest countries. The mobile phone is a wonderful example. And how are we going to bring to scale these applications? Because they are there, but they're there for 100,000 people here or 10 villages there, and they're in spotty. Um, surely the energies of uh, the interconnected community that is represented here should be focused on uh, going, looking at what social entrepreneurs are developing and the, their community um, relevant and then bringing them to scale. And how that we, creates we, a market of billions. How do we make that more of a priority? I think from a business point of view, really, we have to understand business people, we're, we're like fish, we have to live in water, okay? it's healthy water to survive. I cannot see how a business can survive while the society around you is failing. Mm. We cannot. So uh, the health of our business is much related really to the health of our society. If we approach our business with that understanding, I think we'll find the right equilibrium. And I think that, that's the message I really need to, to put across. We cannot succeed in a failing society. I'd like to open up uh, to questions if uh, anyone in the audience uh, has one. There's a gentleman frantically waving his hand back there, but please go ahead. Yeah, from here. Yeah, so uh, quickly to answer more, I was actually in the overflow room to allow for our lovely customers to have space here. So I'm uh, responsible for Google in Africa. And uh, I actually, uh, <laughs> you are the man to blame. And I, I was frantically <laughs> waving and you know shouting there, but nobody heard. Anyway, so uh, so basically, uh, I I actually uh, uh, highly appreciate the the criticism. As a matter of fact, I would uh, join more on his uh, on his point of view. Africa is a very um, is a huge opportunity, but it's also a very complex uh, uh, um, uh, problem to solve. And uh, you know, n not to n not to defend Google. As a matter of fact, we have done quite a um, you know a, a large investment on our side. We're 
you know, our investments in Africa, the, the, the committed to Africa are uh, in, in, in the magnitude of around 15 times any, uh, the revenue that we would ex expect in the coming five years. But the, at, the end of, and at the end of the day, Africa is much bigger uh, than to be solved by Google alone. And I think the, the reality is I actually give it uh, to, to, to the rest of, uh, of our, um, uh, you know, distinguished guests here because um, uh, it goes beyond only broadband. It's also, uh, it goes to the content component of, of the internet. It goes to the commerce component of the internet. It goes to the, uh, the, the infrastructure of the internet because today there are so many villages in Africa that will never ever get broadband like we are used to and, and how you know, the work that Mo has done on the, uh, on the uh, uh, mobile side is definitely a very important part uh, of, of how we can provide knowledge and information to Africa, perhaps not in the way that we are used to uh, in, the, um, uh, you know, in, the, in, in the Western world where we can have access to DSL and the likes. So I think, I think the point is absolutely, I, I, I absolutely agree that we have a, a huge challenge ahead of us. We have a billion people to serve. And uh, it is not a uh, charity work. I think uh, you're yeah. absolutely right. If you serve those people correctly, uh, the opportunities are immense. But there is also the responsibility side of it, where, uh, you know, as Google says, we, we want to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible. If you don't organize the African information and make it accessible to a billion people, then that mission is not achieved. I will just close by saying it's a much bigger mission than Google alone, and it actually requires everybody in the room to jump in. Yeah, just allow me to, 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 to mention that actually it is not a big mission, it's not a big deal. When we introduce mobile networks, I don't know, we always have to rely on the uh, incumbent fixed operator to provide us with the infrastructure. Like if I'm building a cellular network in UK, I'll phone BT and say, okay, I need so many gigabits between London and Birmingham because I'm opening service in Birmingham. You go to DRC, there's no, nobody to phone. You know, actually, the phone is not working and the BT is helping. <laughs> so what you do? I have to build all these highways myself. We have to build all the infrastructure to service our cell size ourselves, which is not our job. But I needed that to develop my, my business. And we, because we have this value added, uh, 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 building the infrastructure itself, turn it quickly to be a very uh, lucrative business because we are able then to lease the extra capacity to the BTT. All the BTTs use our networks. Actually, it is so funny. The VEX guys actually use more of our, of our uh, uh, pipelines than we use of them. And that is a good business. And it's fine. The ISB, various people come and use our, our networks. What I'm arguing is, from the seller point of view, because it still is a narrow band service, what will be this wide band service is people like Google and uh, like, like Microsoft who have the right business case to build that infrastructure because they bought it on and what they're doing and that's a very profitable business and you ought to do it because you're going to make a lot of money. The quicker you do it, you have a billion guys waiting there and imagine if you do that, it's not only because of your cost, because you're also able to lease capacity mm -hmm. to other people. So there is a good business case uh, to be built there, but it needs a powerful central organization to take on the task. And we were a very small company when we started our operation. Yes, we had a three or four billion dollars company, but we started like 20 million dollars company. We, so we're not even uh, up to scale of your company. We started and we did it. So how come you are a giant, you cannot go and do this, you say a big job. It's not a big job. Mary? You got it two years. Mary, weigh in. It's done. Yeah. I, I want to kind of um, come in on the complexity. Um, why not try and build one of these broad public-private partnerships? Um, I happen to chair the Gavi Alliance Board on Immunizing Children. It's UN, World Bank, uh, governments, donor governments, and recipient governments of the 72 poor countries that um, uh, Gavi operates in, and civil society, and the industry, bringing on vaccines uh, for children. Um, and it works. Um, why not try to have that, that type of multifaceted, um, uh, multi-sectoral approach to addressing this digital divide that we yeah. keep hearing about? Um, isn't it time uh, that the, the, the billion was served? I mean, I, I'd love to know whether that's possible. 
Yeah, I'm, uh, w once again, I think uh, absolutely no reason why not. I, as a matter of fact, we probably need to do a better job to, to say about all the attempts we're trying to go through. At, at the end of the day, I, th I, I actually don't push back on this at all. I think, yes, absolutely, we will take every single opportunity that comes our way to develop Africa. I think that's a commitment that we're making now on YouTube. And, uh, you know, it, it is something that we have invested heavily in for the last three years. It's something that we don't expect any revenues back for, from over the, over the short term, even medium term. It's something that is highly in line with the mission of Google. It's something that we believe in. So absolutely, we will take every opportunity that comes on our way to make it happen. Can we get you, any you other... You write other your business plan and I'll help you. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> but, done deal. <laughs> done deal. <laughs> Uh, we just have a few minutes. Um, w is there any other question from the audience uh, for I our... I, I think uh, we have another Google... Oh, yeah. I, I, I'm here. I was standing outside listening to you. More. I just didn't <laughs> want to uh, interrupt while you're speaking. I have a question for you. Uh, why did you sell your infrastructure businesses in Africa? Why, sorry? Why did you sell your infrastructure businesses in Africa? I sell it. Why, yeah. why did you sell your infrastructure businesses in Africa? I sell added Africa? capacity. If I have a big motorway I, 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 I use for myself and I listen to other guys, I make a lot of money. That's why we're so profitable. I want you to be as profitable as me. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the difference maybe is that having made his profits, Mo established this foundation for good leadership. And I serve on the board and on the prize committee of it. Um, I have to say it was a businessman's idea to have a prize and then to have the, the index for, at the moment, the 48 countries of sub-Saharan Africa. And, um, you know, we, we, it's a very detailed index that really is beginning to measure over years now. And because we rank, governments don't like to be going down on the index and other governments going up. And civil society in these countries is beginning to ask questions. And African scholars, African experts, African political scientists, educationists, etc., are taking a sort of ownership. But there is a possibility, I would say, to link this index with Google's capacity to disseminate even more, because we really want um, these to be tools of accountability for better governance for um, governments. Uh, because, um, as Mo put it when he established the foundation, leadership is beyond price. And it's absolutely true. Uh, another non-Google question now. <laughs> <laughs> Does anyone would like to weigh in? Nobody? At all? All right, well, more for me then. Um, what are, we're talking about big corporations here. What about small businesses, medium-sized businesses that, um, you know, what, what opportunities do they have? How should they position themselves in order to survive and to always add that element of social responsibility right. in what they do? You know, two, two sides to it. To start with, if you go with big business, all who generates a lot of small business around it. I'm sure Google, as a big company, have generated a lot of, uh, businesses around uh, around Google. Uh, when 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 we I was running Celtel, I was asking maybe how many jobs you created, and uh, I was looking at the technical directors and the CEOs to tell me I mean, because they, they outsource a lot of things and uh, civil works, uh, maintenance, uh, all sort of. And then actually the sales guys who said no 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 don't look there. We generated the most jobs. I said, why? And actually, we never thought of it. The sales points, everywhere in Africa, within 200 meters, you'll find a kiosk selling scratch cards because it's prepayment. Mm. Africa hasn't got, there's no credit card business. I mean, we, all our service is prepaid. Mm -hmm. And so you have. So many millions of people woke up in Africa, like 400, 300 million people woke up in the morning and everybody wants to buy a scratch card in the morning before they go to work. So imagine the number of sales points. We have over 200,000, that's in my company alone, 200, or most of my companies, not my company anymore, 200,000 sales points. What is each sales point? It's a small business. Somebody put a kiosk there, and we give him 8% or 7%, whatever he gets out of face value. He makes 10 $15 a day. But that's in a country where many people earn $1 a day. He makes just $10 just out in this. But then he puts some coke here, some chewing gum, some apples, some whatever. 
and suddenly he's a businessman. Okay, so big business can always generate a lot of small businesses uh, around them. Those young businessmen, of course, need support. And uh, I was working in the Africa Commission, the Danish Africa Commission, and there's a lot of emphasis now in trying how to help young entrepreneurs. Uh, what essentially need is two things. One is mentoring. They need to be help, advice, you know, technical advice. And the second one is access, reasonable access to some capital. The venture capital industry does not exist in Africa, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And that's what you need to create. Those are the people who created it. I mean, otherwise, you wouldn't have had Googles without the venture capital. We're out of time. Uh, one more question to both of you. What's the key message you want to get across to, to, to business in the context of social responsibility in emerging countries? One uh, message. I, I think it's to think about an idea of corporate citizenship in our world, that we cannot have the divides that we have, that there is a perception now that major corporations have to care about more than the bottom line. And in fairness, more and more of them are caring about more than the bottom line. And, uh, and then how do we have these multi-sectoral 21st century ways of cutting through and getting um, the, uh, the applications for the developing world that are so needed? And uh, you know, the basic electricity, for example, healthcare, um, education, uh, you know, we need uh, to um, have uh, corporate activity, um, uh, NGOs, foundations, all working much more um, uh, and getting synergies. The key to a successful business plan is? Uh, I, I really personally think it's good governance, clean business. There's a premium. I mean, the case of Celtel is taught at a number of business schools, including Harvard, which I don't like because I'm <laughs> on the board of London Business School, which is competitive <laughs> to Harvard. But we, are, we came number one anyway this year, so. Uh, <laughs> It doesn't matter. But uh, uh, <laughs> what, what, I, uh, uh, yeah, well, what I'm trying to say is the, the, the business, uh, the case study here is, is based on the fact that good governance produces a premium. If you run a clean company, if you run a clean business, it produces a premium. When you sell your company, you make more money. So actually, when we appeal to business people, say, yeah, do, do clean business. Actually, it's good for your business. Nothing destroys the business when you start to push dirty money from under the uh, doormats or whatever. Just do clean business, walk the talk. Ladies and gentlemen, I think it's time for a drink. And uh, thank you very much, thank Mo you. Ibrahim, Mary Robinson, for their great insights into all of this. Thank you.